So back in 1985, Mark Herman and Victory Games released what is considered by many to be the definitive game about World War II in the Pacific Theater. This game, Pacific War, Struggle Against Japan, 1941-45. This is my old copy. We will be looking at its brand new edition here today. I think over the course of many live streams and many Twitter posts and all that stuff, I have made it relatively clear that my number one anticipated game of the year for 2021, but it didn't make it, so for 2022, is Pacific War, the struggle against Japan, 1941 to 1945. This is, of course, a new edition of the classic Mark Herman design from Victory Games in 1985. Um, we are going to take a look here today. So first of all, very uh, simple yet striking box cover. I'm going to contrast the photo used, um, which is, you know, sort of the surface action versus this plane taken off from a carrier uh, and the original. I really do like this cover too, actually, but this one I think is equally effective. And the rest of the trade dress I think is more effective than it is on the original. My original, of course, is of course beat to hell and held together largely with contact paper and dreams. So we're happy to, to get this new edition that we have very much been looking forward to for a long, long time, well before it was announced that it was happening. So I will, as with all of the various unboxings that we're doing during part of this marathon series, I'm going to try and figure out or make a statement by the end of the video as to our hopes for getting everything back in the box when we're done. My hopes in this case are not high, even though it is a four inch box. Now let me point out that very few publishers are producing bookshelf war games in four inch boxes nowadays. The only one I'm aware of until now um, is GMT and DVG. Um, previously four inch boxes were confined to the legendary SPI soapbox series like War in Europe here. Uh, this is a four inch bookshelf box and nobody besides DVG has really used this box format for a long time. Even in cases where, and in some cases from GMT, a four inch box would have been greatly appreciated. So I am, I am very happy to see, even though again my hopes are low, um, that GMT has just said, you know, screw it, we're just going to put this in a four inch box. And you're going to see once we open this, because this is like the 90 second unboxing video of this to be released, um, you're going to see that there was no way to put it in a three inch box when you look at the components. So the back of the box looks just as good. Um, Players 1 to 2, uh, we are going to try and team this uh, here locally because this is the next game in our queue locally now that it's here. Um, it's going to take a couple of weeks to punch and clip and organize it, and then we will be getting it to a table. Um, complexity 9, which to be completely truthful feels a little high to me. I'd, I'd call it an 8. Um, solitaire suitability is a 2. Um... That might be a hair low, but there's quite a bit of hidden information too. So uh, I'm not going to argue with a, with a solitaire suitability of two for this thing. Um, it's got a 2021 date on the box, but it's it's 2022. We all know that. So let's open her up and see what I have been waiting literal years to have under my greasy fingers. Very excited. Very excited. And I intentionally, of all the games that showed up, I'm unboxing this one. The, the videos might not get released in this order, but I'm filming this one last. So I would not allow my excitement to completely carry me away with energy. Now, there is no box insert in this box, okay? There's roughly three-eighths of an inch of clearance space in that box. All right, so what do we got? Let's do it. We're going to go through all the components, but let's just take it out of the box for now. We're going to have four booklets. The core rules, the engagement rules, the battle rules. There's going to be five booklets, I'm sorry. There's the scenario booklet. Um, now, the rule books are available in PDF form on GMT's website, so go check those. And I've been looking at it in, in preparation for getting this thing. Um, and, you know, it's going to take me actually setting it up. But And we get a fifth book, The Battle of the Coral Sea Extended Example of Play. Um, we get two ten-sided dice, a blue die and an orange die. Uh, I have my own special 
bespoke dice set already allocated to this game. We get two mounted maps. We get, we're gonna, we're gonna try to be super careful with the counters here. Huge box. Huge. So we get the two mounted maps. There is a third map here that I don't know where it is in the stack, but it's, you know, here it is. That is a scenario map. It is a half-sized paper scenario map. And the, the idea here is that... So the, the whole game, footprint-wise, is not that big if you just think about, okay, it's a two-map game, right? There's a lot of two-map games that aren't really that big of games, but this also requires a decent amount of table space to be dedicated to displays and task force displays and stuff like that. Um, so with all of that extra table space and this half-sized map, it turns out that you can play the great majority of the scenarios, the campaign scenarios. We'll talk about that in a minute, about what kinds of scenarios are available in Pacific War. Um, and most of the campaigns are able to be played on this paper map, as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the giant maps. So, first things first, we're going to put that back in the box. Second thing second, we're going to take a look at the mounted maps. Because these are interesting, and I haven't really seen this from GMT before. These are glossy mounted maps. Um, these look not particularly like other GMT maps that I have seen and handled. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's it's unusual. I haven't seen a glossy... I'm so confused. Um, a glossy map from G, mounted map from GMT before. So, all right. So I have chosen the, uh, the one that's mostly ocean, of course. Um, but... You can see we have, well, I don't know what you can see in the in frame here, but we have northern Japan and uh, the Aleutians up here, uh, Siberia, uh, and the Hawaiian Islands are down here, okay? So it is a very attractive map. I'm going to actually set the second one up as well, since it looks like we're going to want to lay these flat for a while. Um, because the second map is the one that you're going to end up playing the great majority of the game on. Um, if you play the, the scenarios, the, the campaign scenarios. Uh, so these look great. Uh, it is a weird map projection, so it kind of you kind of tilt your head at it at first, and you're like, that's weird. How, how is that even the whole Pacific Ocean? But it is. It's just a, you know, it's a different kind of map projection. Here we have Australia. Here we have, of course, the, the giant archipelago off the coast of Southeast Asia. And here we have China, Indochina, and the very southern end of Japan. Um... And of course, a lot of the uh, the the action in a Pacific campaign that is a, a lot of it happened down here. Let me put it that way. So um, you're going to end up with a lot of good scenarios that happen down here in this area. All right. So let's next take a look at the player eights. There's a lot of these two, and. As far as I can tell from the other unboxings and from what Mark has said, the player aids are basically not changed from the original edition. So here we have a replacement record sheet. I'm not sure if you use this outside of the, the full campaign. We'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. I wish I had gone through the... I almost always go through the rule books first, and I wish I had gone through the rule books first. Uh, we'll, we'll do the books next. All right, and then we have these screens... This is the Japanese screen, and there's an allied screen as well. Um, and this contains a variety of tables that you need, the ground combat results table, the air naval combat results table, and, and a lot of the game works off this table, um, and then the search table. Um, these two tables should be the same between the two screens, but the Japanese search table is d different from the Allied search table. And this is this is a screen. This is a four-panel cardstock thing that you can then set up to hide your stuff from the villainous other player. Um, you know, we have this thing, which is the Japanese display sheet, okay, with a general records track and a phase track so that you can go through all the different phases of the turn and the battle cycles. Again, we'll talk more about that. Uh, you have this kind of huge calendar. <laughs> um, the turns are... It's got an, a really interesting telescoping time mechanic. Um which we're going to have to 
get into in a future video because I won't be able to do it justice or even explain it in a non-completely half-baked way in the context of this video, which is already going to run long. Um, this is the Allied screen. Again, it's pretty much the same stuff, um, except that there's, to my understanding, there's some differences on the search tables. Um, here is the Allied display, which is exactly the same as the Japanese one, except it's got different counters on it. Uh, this is one that you always will want set up. This is the operations display. Um, you'll kind of run your naval combats off of this thing. Uh, you'll, you'll do your turn management on this day track. Um, and then you'll have these naval strategic initiative and naval movement things, which will be adjusted. Not 100% sure those naval movement you'll use all the time, but strategic initiative may, might be a campaign game only thing. That's something I'm still wrapping my head around. All right, you have force displays. There should be four force displays for each side. So here's Japanese display four, three, allied display three, Japanese two, allied two, Japanese one, allied one. So, and these, what, what goes on these are activated naval units go into task forces um, and then they have special task force rules that apply to them. Um, forces are just like forces on the map somewhere. Um, and there's their forces and task forces behave, behave a bit differently. Forces are always considered detected. Task forces are not always considered detected. You have to actually search for them and find them. Um, so let's look at the books, the, all the books. And we're going to do, we're going to talk about the rules first, okay? And they're all going to be similar in terms of um, layout and paper quality and all that stuff. At least I assume so. So you have the shortest of the three, the engagement scenario rulebook, and this is a forty-page book with an index. But the index is the full index. Um, so what what this is is it's the core rules manual. This is the master rulebook to the whole game. This has all the rules in it, regardless of what you're trying to do. It's all in here. The engagement rules is this exact book, except everything that you don't use in the engagement scenarios are cut out, and there's a little thing that says, you don't use this rule in the engagement scenarios. <clears throat> the battle scenario rules book is exactly the same thing, except that everything that you don't use in the battle scenarios is removed, and you have a little thing that says, you don't use this stuff in the battle scenarios. And then the core rules manual is the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so looking at the core rules manual then, where we have, you know, full index, it's a 68 page book. This is obviously the longest of the bunch. I've been talking now for so long. Huge table of contents. Uh, feels really nice, full color, matte finish, exactly the kind of thing I like in a rule book, full color, matte finish. Um, goes all the way through all of the different sequences, all of the different, you know, how to run operations, all that stuff, special rules for India, China, uh, Dutch East Indies, so uh, even got rules for the USSR, which I haven't looked at that yet at all. Have not gotten that far. So in, in principle, the idea is that you can start with the, and we'll look at the scenarios in a minute, that you can start with the engagement scenario rules, read this, play the engagement scenarios, and then have a good basis for moving on to the next uh, level of scenarios. So let's talk about the scenarios. There are essentially four different levels, if you will, of scenario in Pacific War. And while there are a bunch of additional scenarios in this edition, this is all as it was in the original edition as well. There are engagement scenarios which basically represent one battle cycle. Um, you can have up to three battle cycles in a specific turn. If I'm wrong about any of this, feel free to correct me in the comments. But the engagement scenarios do not leave the battle cycle. I think you might get three battle cycles or two battle cycles in the Pearl Harbor scenario, for example. Uh, but you don't, like, do a whole turn or anything like that. Now, the battle cycle is part of an operation. And the battle scenarios are individual operations. Um, they're also relatively small. Engagement scenarios, although depending on how you organize this, they might take you a while to set up. None of them should take a particularly long amount of time to play. The battle scenarios might take a couple hours to play. Once you know what you're doing, again, <clears throat> aside from setting them up. Um, there are eight engagement scenarios. Pearl Harbor, Savo Island. Uh, Savo Island is sometimes called the 
worst naval defeat in the history of the U.S. Navy. Uh, that's the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, where uh, the U.S. did not do well, or the part of it in which they did not do well. First invasion of Wake Island, the invasion of Burma, the Battle for Impal and Kohima, Force Z from Singapore. That, of course, is the Repulse and the Prince of Wales, two British battleships that are sunk by Japanese air. Raid on Darwin, Battle of the Java Sea. Uh, then we have the battle scenarios. We have 12 of those, Wake Island, Relief of, well, Relief of Wake Island, Battle of the Coral Sea, Midway. So if you've played Flat Top, that's Coral Sea. Um, Midway, if you've played Midway, that's Midway. Battle of the Eastern Solomons, Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, Leyte Gulf, Indian Ocean Adventure, the Aleutians, the Kiska Campaign, which is up in the Aleutians, uh, Operation Land Crab. Now, the campaign scenarios are series of, a, a series of operations which may take place over the span of one to many months of game time. This is where the meat of the game is, okay? These are not the entire war, but this will give you the in entire individual campaigns. So if I have said the operational scenarios, these are more or less what I'm talking about. And there's nine of these. Malaya, the Philippines, Southern Conquests, Guadalcanal, Battle for the Upper Solomons, Breaking the Bismarck Barrier, War in the Central Pacific, War in the Western Pacific, and China-Burma. So you do have, like, land campaigns here as well. Um, and then the strategic scenarios represent the entirety of World War II in the Pacific, at least starting in December 1941. And there's two of these, and then three additional ones that just have later starts. The Pacific War, Rising Sun in the Pacific, and then the Barrier and the Javelin, and you could start that in either April, May, or June of 1942. So, <clears throat> looking at the scenario book, you do get... So this kind of serves as a playbook, too, here. There is errata already available on GMT's website. Highly recommended that you check that out. Um, there are some significant clarifications. Aren't, there's some errata errata, but there's some significant clarifications too that might explain some things in the scenario setups that might not otherwise make any sense. So how to learn Pacific War, important play note on historical designations, postulated play times. So when, when we say, the back of the box I think says this is like one to 100 hours, the campaign game probably does take one to 100 hours, but this, the you could probably pay, play everything else in a weekend, or at least a long weekend. Um, okay, so here we go with our engagement scenarios. And we're going to just do, give these a super fast flip through at this point, because we've already done all the necessary talking about this. And this goes clear to the end with strategic scenario setups. Uh, okay, so here we have the credits by edition. So Victory Games, GMT, uh, development on the new edition, Gary Gonzalez and Marcus Stumter. Rules editor by Kai Jensen. Map art by Oliver Revenue. Uh, counter art by Mark Simonich, it looks like it. Rules and scenario books by Charlie Killer and Justin Martinez. So interesting, uh, technical and research assistance on the original Victory Games edition was Tony Curtis. So wait a minute. It's not that Tony Curtis, though. It's the other Tony Curtis. It's this Tony Curtis, not Tony Curtis, who's the guy that was in Some Like It Hot. That's not that Tony Curtis. Uh, research assistance by Al Nafi, uh, David Isby, and Jack Rady. That's in itself interesting. Uh, play testers include Joe Belkowski, Nick Carp, Eric Lee Smith, Tony Curtis, uh, and uh, a bunch of others. Um, very interesting. Project oversight by Lara Herman, who was two years old at the time. Project oversight, Lara Herman, 37 years old. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, so let's take a, a look as well at the extended example of play. So I often say, you know, this is not an option, right? These games need these. Um, and it was taken so seriously in, in this example that the example of play gets its own entire booklet. Um, now, our designer's notes are in here as well. But even so, uh, here we have this Battle of the Coral Sea extended example of play. I am going to read this with an absolute fine-tooth comb. So... And here we have some individual breakout situations inside the example of play. So this looks this looks extraordinarily well done. And I am, to say the least, very, very pleased with it. Now, let's take a look 
at our last piece of the Pacific War puzzle, the counters. There are 10 counter sheets here in Pacific War. These are on the new quite thick brown coarse stuff from GMT. Now, there are two counter sizes here, and I think this lines up with the way the counters were sized in Empire of the Sun, where the ships are bigger and everything else is smaller. So here we have uh, U.S. planes. Um, these are presumed, the green is U presumably U.S. Army and the light blue is presumably U.S. Navy. These are what I take to be uh, possession markers or control markers. OSB, uh, that's supply something. Okay. And these are half inch counters. Let's be very careful about the die cutting, which looks good to me at a glance. Okay. Registration, I'm also, I want this game to be perfect, man. That's what it is. So if there's a small problem with registration or something like that on one of these sheets, I'm totally going to complain. Um, I don't always, if it's not a thing that I'm going to really have to worry about. Here I will absolutely complain because I want it to be perfect. Um, so here we ha we start getting into some Japanese air. Uh, this is probably going to be Japanese Army, Imperial Japanese Navy, uh, and bases. There is a finite number of Japanese bases available. And actually the, the whole counter mix is intended to be a hard limit on what you can have. Um, here we have what looks like British air, British carrier-based air, more Japanese air. Uh, what I take to be Dutch air down here. I'm not sure what these guys are right here. Uh, these are nationalist Chinese, however. Okay. Here we are into the ground units. And ground units in this game system run from brigades or, and or regiments up to army groups. <laughs> I think these red, dark red guys are the communist Chinese and they're in army groups um, the factors don't mean the traditional factors. There's the first ground factor here is a troop quality. Uh, the second number is a, I forget what the second number is. I think an anti-air value. And the third number is the number of steps in the unit. So you can have this division that's 16 steps, this other division that's eight steps. Uh, again, correct me if any of that is nonsense, please. Uh, here we have some, what I take to be U.S. Marines. Here's some New Zealanders. Um, it goes without saying, I'm going to say it anyway, because I like to hear myself talk, that uh, this is an, just world's level of better than the, 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 the Victory Games counters, um, uh, that, which were very difficult to read. They were very cluttered. They had, you know, huge gutters on the sides. These look fantastic. Uh, I am, like, not seeing anything that resembles a problem here so far. Uh, here we have some Japanese Marines. Here we start to get into the ships, okay, where the, the big money, literally, uh, in the Pacific War was. Now, the individual capital ships, like the carriers and battleships, I think represent individual vessels, but the, the smaller ships, like light cruisers and destroyers and stuff like that, represent vehicles in the class. So you might have, um, for example, these Fletcher-class destroyers. You've heard of the Fletcher-class destroyers. These are all named Fletcher, right? Because these are the Fletcher-class destroyer or flotillas of Fletcher-class destroyers. Um, we have submarine patrols down here. My understanding, based on reading the rules that says, hey, we changed the submarine rules, is that they changed the submarine rules. I haven't read the submarine rules yet, so I'm not sure how they're different. Uh, the Leander, which would be a would that even be? That's a um, Australian ship, maybe. Um, but here's some some Dutch vessels. Uh, here's some British vessels, including some battleships, including the Prince of Wales. The Repulse is probably in here as well. Uh, here we have task forces and forces. Um, these represent engineering. These represent ops complete. Um, you can see that there's more task forces available for the Allies than there are with the uh, with the Japanese. It, it, while you can just put all your units on the map, um, the intention is that basically all your units are kept off map on the force displays. 
um, and that you move the force markers around. Now these are hit markers, a uh, whole sheet of these, and these are for hits on your naval units, and they go up to 10, although I don't know if there's a ship that'll take 10, so I'm not sure why that's important. You probably need it for uh, land units, actually. Uh, here we have the uh, allied bases and a, a bunch of additional markers. There's not that many additional markers. Now, 10 counter sheets of thick counters, many of which are bigger than half an inch, which I'm, you know, that by itself I'm completely fine with. Um, so I'm, what I'm now going to do is the grand experiment of exactly what I can fit into the box with all the pieces back in the box. The big space consuming item here is not the counters, it's going to be the two mounted boards. And, and I'll be honest, it's, 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 it always feels very luxurious to get a game with two mounted maps, with a mounted map in general, but with two mounted maps specifically. Uh, but that does represent significant problems toward getting everything back in the box. All right. And in this case, counters I'm leaving out for now. Okay. I'm putting everything else back in. So there's the two mounted maps, the one paper map, the big stack of player aids. And let's space this out like that just to try to do that. I'm a little surprised that I can get two counter trays in this box without the counter sheets. Nevertheless, I don't believe I can organize this game at all in two counter sheets. I think this is a four to five counter sheet, counter tray game. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, Victory Games edition is in three counter trays, and it took me an hour to set up Pearl Harbor. So there's a reason why efficiency in terms of uh, counter organization is desirable. So... What I think we're going to get stuck with here is... I don't even think there's enough room in baggies. And, and I think baggies would be a pain. So I think we're going to end up with an outside-the-box counter-storage solution for Pacific War. It, it will literally be the only one-shot game, not part of a series, that is like that for me. Uh, nevertheless, I've been so excited about this for so long that I will just deal with that. Uh, we'll have a video on it at some point uh, about how we're storing their Pacific War counters. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, there is I don't want to commit to anything specific, but it is 100% on my itinerary to do videos on Pacific War. Um, so stay tuned for whatever happens there. We're going to talk about it on the counter clipping stream again, so stay tuned for that Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully you have found this illuminating. If so, please do give it a thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel and please do click the little bell icon to get notified when new content comes out. If you'd like to do more to help support Ardwolf Slayer, it would be greatly appreciated if you would check out the links in the video description to the Patreon, the merch store, and the Ko-Fi. Also, please do check out the Monday Night Live stream, although there isn't one this Monday night as I'm filming this, but they're normally on Monday nights at 8 p.m., so check those out. Lots of fun is had. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, happy wargaming. gaming.